Good morning, folks. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you might be joining us from. Welcome. Welcome to this very special webinar. If you cannot tell, Ed and me are very excited. Uh, we are old, but we are we have been doing .NET for quite some time, and I think this is one of the best times to be a .NET developer. .NET 8 is here, and we are here to unpack all the things uh, about productivity and how we build the next generation of amazing apps with .NET 8, and how can we help uh, with all things uh, Telerik. So, Welcome again. We are your hosts. Uh, I'm Sam Basu. With me, I have my good friend, Ed Charbonneau. While you see and hear the two of us, we have some very smart engineers and uh, you know project managers uh, in the background. So utilize this time to ask us you know any questions as we go along. So let's uh, dive in. We are all here about uh, you know for your productivity, your success. Um, Ed, how do you feel about .NET 8 uh, right now? I think we're in one of the best places in .NET that we've been in in quite some time, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. The ecosystem is so rich. The tooling is great. Uh, we can reach just about every platform, so it's a really good time. And hopefully, uh, we can show you that uh, we are here to enable your success uh, going forward, trying to make you as productive as you can be. Um, now, this is a quick agenda for today. Uh, we are promising 90 minutes. That's all the time we are uh, you know, getting from you, and we are very thankful for that. We do have a lot of content, uh, both Ed and me, so we'll try our best to do like 45 minutes each. Uh, there is a lot to cover between, you know, modern .NET, the tooling, AI, containers, you know, Teleric UI across, you know, web, desktop, mobile. So a lot to cover. We'll try to do justice in, you know, 90 minutes or so. So that's our agenda for the day. Again, keep asking those questions all along. So, you know, when we do the release webinars, uh, if you are using, uh, you know, Telaric products, uh, thank you for your patronage. If you're new uh, to the Telaric and the Progress uh, family, welcome on board. Hopefully you can see we have a broad portfolio uh, of, you know, products, you know, that try to keep you uh, productive. And it's not just .NET, we do a lot of other things. We do a lot of JavaScript, we do CMS, we do digital experiences, and it's all there to try to make your apps more, you know, fluid and uh, accessibility is big for us. Um, so all of those things are there to, you know, try to make you more successful. So this time around, we thought we'll take a slightly different take. Uh, we'll talk about the ecosystem, we'll talk about the tooling uh, in general before uh, we dive into uh, some of the core things, because. You know, I'm big into, um, you know, mobile stuff and desktop. I'm all about .NET MAUI and desktop applications. Ed is all about Blazor and web apps. But, you know, let's talk about .NET as to where things are a little bit before we get to uh, some of our updates. So this is modern.net. Uh, you may have seen this uh, from Microsoft and you know from everybody else. It's a good place to be, like Ed said. It's unified. It's you know taking us a while to get here, but you know .net six onwards, .net seven and .net eight. It really is a unified stack, and you can reach just about every platform, uh, every type of form factor with modern.net. The tools are great across Windows, you know Mac, all Linux, um, you know OS operating systems. We'll talk about some containers. Everything is very optimized for your workflow. So the ecosystem with you know libraries and frameworks and UI tools. We should not try to reinvent the wheel, and everything is set up for you uh, to be as productive as you can be. So that's modern.net in a nutshell. Uh, and again, we don't need to tell you modern.net has also been you know um, enjoying a lot of momentum, a lot of growth. Uh, you know, look at the number: 6.5 million developers every month. Um, so that that's a lot, and you know it's you know very heavily admired, uh, high velocity open source projects. So you know what's what's not to like. Uh, now, um, .NET uh, gets an annual release every year, and as we speak today, .NET 8 has been out for you know, just a couple of weeks now. Every November, we get a new .NET, and this one here is a little special. .NET 8 carries with it what's called the LTS badge, long-term support. So enterprises uh, and folks like you um, have a little bit more confidence going and you know jumping onto .NET 8 because you are assured of support for you know, X number of years. Uh, so with the .NET 8 release, we also had .NET Conf, which was a big virtual event, uh, you know, and all of the sessions uh, across all of things .NET, they're all online. Um, so, you know, take the time to, you know, dive into what, you know, matters to you. Um, Ed and we are big fans of all the content uh, that was presented at .NET Conf. Now, let's talk a little bit about tooling uh, and, and some of the other, you know, uh, areas of .NET that are exciting. If you are on Windows, <coughs> excuse me, um, then Visual Studio 2022, that's the IDE that does everything for you, right? It's a great place to write code. 
debug. Uh, you know, the debugging experience is fantastic. Testing, version control, uh, collaboration with you know other members of your team, deployment, everything is in one place. It's a rich, rich IDE that does everything. However, modern.net also invites everybody uh, you know to be productive. So folks like me are mostly on you know Mac or Linux. Uh, so we have VS Code, uh, which is a fantastic uh, cross-platform lightweight uh, source code editor. It has multiple language support, and the biggest thing is the extensions marketplace where you know you can grab whatever you need for the type of apps that you're building and you get to be productive it's lightweight and it just works great and you'll as you'll see with some of the modern uh you know workflows like with blazer or dotnet maui you are perfectly productive no matter which id that you choose so essentially you need to understand where the differences are choose the uh, tool that works the best for you. If you're on Windows, it's kind of a no-brainer uh, to do Visual Studio, but VS Code also will give you the same experiences in a browser. Or if you're using things like GitHub Code Spaces, or for if you are using things like Microsoft DevBox, which is essentially a VM in the cloud that you can connect up to and be productive from anywhere or from any device. So, you know, a lot of options as to how you are productive, but it's, you know, all there for you. Uh, so let's dive in a little bit more. C-Sharp Dev Kit, this is essentially a VS Code extension that makes you productive. So um, Ed, I don't know how you feel about this, but as a C-Sharp developer, I do not miss uh, you know, not being in Visual Studio, like the IDE, because I am perfectly fine in VS Code. All of the IntelliSense, all of the AI that I you know, love and uh, you know, like to use these days, it's all right there for me um, in, in VS Code. Yeah, so it's, um, you're good. You know, with uh... Visual Studio for Mac going away too. It's going to be uh, the kind of uh, highlighted option for doing dev on um, a, a Mac platform. Yeah, and, yeah, it is uh, the cross-platform editor of choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about a few things that we, again, don't get to talk a whole lot, Ed and me. Uh, I'm a big fan of containers because it, it's one thing to be able to build your .NET apps, but how do you deploy those apps? Uh, you know, Docker and other containers have been very popular. Uh, you can take those containers to the cloud, have a really easy way of, you know, deploying your .NET apps along with all of the dependencies. There has been quite a bit of work done with Ubuntu uh, for folks who run things on AWS or Azure, and you want that lightweight, uh, you know, footprint. Uh, Canonical has done some fabulous work with some chiseled containers. So now it's that much easier, uh, that much lower of a footprint to deploy your uh, you know, .NET apps uh, elsewhere. So we'll talk a little bit about containers. And you know, we cannot uh, do anything these days without talking about AI. It is everything is changing how we you know, maybe work uh, and get productive as developers. So .NET loves AI because you know what's not to like. Uh, now, of course, with everything, you have to take things um, with a grain of salt. You have to do things that are ethically right. Your company might have policies about how much AI you want to use, but it's all there for you if you want to tap into any open AI. Azure has uh, amazing services, uh, you know, where they host a lot of the large language models, the science behind the AI, uh, and you're seeing Copilot, uh, you know, making developers more productive inside of Windows, inside of Visual Studio, inside of VS Code, and .NET is right there for you. Uh, so if you want to have that customization, if you want to bring in a little bit of AI in your .NET apps, you should, you know, feel right at home. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And we are, of course, here to make you productive. Uh, you know, for those of you who are using our things, uh, our UI and our frameworks and our solutions for a while, you already know this, but the Telerik family is all about .NET developer productivity. We make UI for everything you can think of uh, for .NET developers, web, desktop, or mobile. And again, if you're doing JavaScript, you're welcome to. We make uh, Kinder UI for all flavors of JavaScript, Angular, React, uh, Vue, jQuery, you name it. And actually the .NET and the JavaScript worlds are playing along so much nicer these days uh, where we can have web apps working nicely in mobile and desktop. So. A lot of productivity here for you. And we genuinely care about your experience as a .NET developer. Uh, so if you're you know, looking to use any of our tools, uh, check out the app stores. We have demo apps uh, for desktop and mobile. Um, you know, check out the demos, see how we are utilizing. Uh, it looks like edit your back, your camera froze for a bit. Um, but Demos uh, is where everything is at. Docs is where we spend a lot of time uh, and effort trying to make sure your experience is good. And then if you need something from us that you don't see, or if you just want to have a comment, feedback.telerate.com. And we genuinely read and you know, care about your experiences. 
All right, now uh, let's talk about a few things here. I'm gonna talk about mobile and desktop a little bit and then lean a little bit into uh, the website, which is all of Ed's. Uh, but just really quickly going through this, how do we build for mobile? I say 2024 because it's not yet there yet, but it's almost holiday season. And if you are starting an app today, you are likely not shipping it this year. So you have a lot of choices. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but if you're doing web things, you know, stick to your web things. You have a lot of frameworks, you know, mobile web, PWA, uh, all of these things are, you know, meant to bring your web apps. And now it's also much more welcome with .NET MAUI, um, you know, running on mobile and desktop. So, you know, choose the stack that works for you, have a code base that you'd like to maintain. And speaking of .NET MAUI, I'm obviously a big fan. Uh, it's evolved a lot coming from .NET 6 days. Uh, now we have mobile and we have desktop. So a lot of folks, uh, our enterprise customers are building line of business, uh, complex desktop apps with .NET uh, MAUI. And you can see the .NET MAUI team, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, enable all types of desktop scenarios. And we are trying to do our best because keyboard and mouse are different uh, game compared to touch. Um, so the same exact code base with shared resources can now power both experiences. And that's not something we take lightly. So a lot of effort has gone into making sure .NET MAUI is good for all of your web apps as well, or all of your mobile apps, as well as all of your desktop apps as well. Speaking of desktop, again, uh, I'm going to fly through some of this, but lots of options, right? If you want to reach Windows, you know, uh, don't let anyone tell you WinForms and WPF are not the way to go because they run on .NET 8 today. And I'm going to show you some demos. Uh, WinUI, if you want the latest Windows stack. But if you want to do web stuff, that is welcome to uh, on Windows. But in, in the last couple, Blazor Hybrid and .NET MAUI through WinUI are, you know, the latest uh, stacks coming from you know, .NET MAUI. Same uh, story for Mac OS and Linux. Again, unless you have a real strong need to go, you know, just on that one platform, you don't want to go just native. You want to do something cross-platform. So again, be it web, be it .NET, uh, you can get uh, to Mac and uh, Linux in a fair easy. So uh, speaking of uh, mixing and matching things, Blazor and Ed is obviously a huge fan. And you know what's not to get excited about Blazor? It is C sharp everywhere. Uh, it is the .NET that you love and care. Uh, now it lets you build modern web apps that can be entirely client side or entirely server side or a mix of the two. And what I care about Blazor is you're taking it out of the web, although. Uh, Ed wants to stay all in the browser, but you can actually make very nice PWAs, very nice Electron apps, and the .NET MAUI story is particularly nice, which is what we call Blazor Hybrid. So you can take all the goodness of the web and bring it to mobile and desktop. So a lot of good things, you know, code sharing, uh, a lot of avenues to, you know, try to be productive as .NET developers. All right, Ed, any thoughts here before I uh, jump into some demos? Um, you know. Maui's really compelling. Uh, we we talked a little bit before the show here, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, the devices working this morning. But um, with Maui, you can deploy .NET apps all over the place, including uh, one of my favorite toys right now, the uh, Oculus VR headset. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what you can do with Maui, and then we'll show off some of the Blazor side of things later. Absolutely. And you can take uh, Dr. Maui to Tizen so it can run on your TV or your fridge or your smartphone. So, you know, uh, the world is your oyster. So if you're new to .NET, you know, get started. .NET gets you here. Uh, you can get all the tools. You can get the runtimes, everything. Uh, so we are doing a webinar on .NET 8. So obviously I am on .NET 8, uh, but I'm going to take you to my um, uh, command line here just for a second here just to show that I am absolutely on .NET 8. Uh, however, .NET is also... You know, it's not your old school .NET. So if I do a list of my SDKs, you can see I have .NET 6, 7, and 8. They all, you know, coexist. .NET is a folder. You can blow it away. You can re-get it as many times as you want. You can bundle it with your apps. Uh, so it's, you know, nice and flexible. So speaking of that, uh, let's watch my time here. I'm 15 minutes in. Uh, again, keep the questions coming as I'm running through uh, some things here that I find exciting. So let me uh, go into uh, a folder here. Um, and uh, let's see, I want to take you into a .NET uh, deploy folder. Let's talk a little bit about how you run your .NET apps. And uh, let's go in, I think there is an app folder in here and I have VS Code uh, running uh, or uh, as an environment uh, variable. So it can, you know, bring this up uh, in my path. Uh, so there's my VS Code. Now this is, you know, modern uh, and popular. 
uh, Lightweight Code Editor. Uh, I will show you Visual Studio as well, but you can see all of that uh, on the Windows side with Ed. I'm trying to show you the cross-platform things. Uh, by the way, when you are on VS Code, uh, take a look at the extensions marketplace. This is where things light up. This is where things are so much nicer. Get the things that you need to be productive. There is just a huge marketplace of all types of extensions, no matter what language you're doing. Um, so these are the some of the you know absolute must uh, have ones. The C Sharp Dev Kit, which gives you C Sharp intelligence and productivity. Uh, C Sharp language tools. We'll talk about Copilot in a second. I'm a big fan of the Material Icon theme. It essentially makes your files nicer. It recognizes what those files are. And these are the two that I will talk about. Uh, we have some extensions for Mavi and extensions for Blazor, which are really nice. Uh, but let's start off with a Hello World type uh, terminal project here. So what I have here uh, is just a Hello World, uh, just console right line Hello World. And you know Ed is big into aesthetics. He has some design sense. So I cannot just print Hello World. I have to bring in a fancy font to make Ed happy. And then I have a little counter here that essentially every second it counts uh, the counter. So that's how simple it is. So let me go ahead and run this here. I'm going to uh, come out of this. And let's do a .NET run. Again, simple uh, .NET console app is what we are running here. So you will see that's the fancy hello world to make uh, Ed happy with my fancy font. And every second, it's a counter, right? And I can stop it, and then it stops, right? Now, a lot of people might not know this, but uh, well, maybe a lot of you do because you're experienced uh, in a .NET dev. So you can actually send in parameters. So I can say, just count until 5. Oh, apparently, I don't know my, uh, uh, my input strings. Is it just dash? Uh, Whatever is dash five, maybe. Uh, no. All right, we'll try one more and then we'll stop. And uh, maybe, oh, there it is. I have to do a space. So I can send in a parameter and then it stops at five. It, the program does, just does not keep on going. So just hello world.net. Now, just to show you what this looks like, here's the app. Here is, um, let's go into the .NET deploy. When I'm running the app locally, this is what it's doing. So bin. If I go into my debug, that's my .NET 8 runtime, and you see all of my dependencies. So this is what it needs to run. There's the figgle.dll. So if you have a .NET Blazor application or an ASP.NET application and you're bringing in Telerik UI, all of your dependencies are just a part of that executable. Now, we can do a little better. Now, this is .NET uh, app running locally. Now, what if we actually did um, a publish? So let's go back in here. I will do... Um, I'll try to remember some of my last commands. Let's do a .NET publish, right? So essentially what this is doing is, um, oh, it is one level up. So let's go up one level and let's do a .NET publish. So what this is doing is building my .NET app, but it's getting it ready for publication. So now if I go back here, you will see there is a, uh, there is a new publish uh, folder. And let's also do uh, a .NET publish with uh, a self-contained uh, option here. So let's go back. Uh, let's go back, let's go back. Um, yeah, so publish with a self-contained true. So what we're trying to do here is wrap up .NET runtime and you know publish that uh, together. So now um, let's go into release here. Uh, so there is my publish. This is for the .NET uh, just running it locally. But since I'm on a Mac, it also gives me an OS X ARM64. Now, this is all of the .NET that your app needs to run. So you can take this folder and run it on any machine, any server that doesn't even have .NET because all of the you know, necessary bits are you know, right there for you. Um, so this is you know, one way of running it, including all of your dependencies. But let's talk about containers here for just a second. Uh, I am going to bring up our beloved Docker container here. So that's going to spin up the Docker engine. And you can see it's starting up here. Um, and now I'm trying to containerize uh, my .NET applications. You can see I have an image here. An image is essentially what are the things that my image, my container needs to have to run. So uh, unbeknownst to us, there is also a little Docker file in this uh, terminal lab. It's just you know, saying, go to Microsoft you know, repositories and you know, bring down an image that has the .NET runtime. Go ahead and publish that image, copy over the working directories, and off you go. Right. So that is me just you know, trying to containerize that. That app. So uh, I have an image running, but I actually don't have a container running. So I, my app is not you know, hosted anywhere, but I do know how to run that image. So let's now go ahead and uh, try to do a little bit of um, uh, a create uh, of an image. Let's see if I can remember any of my um, commands here. Uh, let's do uh, this one. So I'm going to create a container. 
uh, with that image in mind. So let's go ahead and do that. It gives me a quit. So now if I come back to Docker, uh, there is my container, but it's not actually running yet, right? But it's, you know, I have not attached to it, but it's, it is it is kind of running. So if I go ahead and um, let's see if I can bring it back to where we attach it. Uh, so like this one here. So I am attaching myself to that container. Oh, it's not started yet. So, all right, we'll go ahead and start it. Uh, just so you don't see me typing, I have some of these old ones that we're running. Uh, this one here. So I'm starting starting up the container. Now it is running. So now I can attach myself to that container core. Now you can see that it starts from five because the container is running uh, and I just wasn't listening. Now it's Now it is running, right? Uh, and uh, if I go ahead and stop it now, the container is still running my app. It, it is still running. So if I reattach myself, uh, now you can see it starts off from 22 onwards. So it's a nice way to you know start running your apps. So this is you know .NET with all of its dependencies and everything is running fine. However, uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, kill this for a second. Uh, what is uh, not so nice about this is just a base .NET uh, app with just one dependency. It's a, maybe a Telerik dependency is about you know, 248 uh, megabytes. So this is something new that was done in .NET 8, and these are called chiseled containers. So it can be much, much better. So let me go back into my app here, and I'm gonna take you back to uh, my CS proj here, where I'm gonna enable two more uh, lines of code. And these are bringing in some dependencies. So I'm saying I want my MS builds to be a little smarter. So I'm building in the, you know, bringing in the containers. And I am asking for a specific container family called Jammy Chiseled. This is Ubuntu. Essentially, the latest Ubuntu release is called uh, Jammy Jellyfish. So it's called Jammy Chiseled. Uh, so with that one change, now I can go ahead and um, you know build another um, uh, container. Uh, let's see if I can find the Jammy Chiseled one. Uh, let's see, go back, go back. This one here, so .NET Publish. Uh, but I'm specifying that I want that particular runtime and I want Linux ARM64. So if I go ahead and do a build and publish for that, uh, see it's optimizing the assemblies for time uh, and now it's you know almost done. So now let's go back here to my uh, Docker container. You see the chisel tag uh, created two seconds ago, but look at the difference in size, 30 megabytes. This is all that you need with modern.net to go run it and deploy it on any cloud, any container, that's how chiseled it is. So it is bare basic of whatever the OS you need, whatever .NET runtime you need, and whatever your app needs on top of it. So really, really optimized workflows, and you can carry all of your Telerik dependencies with it. So um, just something that's you know really nice. All right. So moving on from uh, containers, I will quit the Docker engine so it just you know doesn't sit there. Uh, let's move on to a little bit of you know AI because that's also everywhere. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, close this for a minute. And uh, Sam, have, to open have you noticed um, any speed increases uh, yeah. as we're with all of these, you know, greenfield applications that you're you're demoing? Absolutely. Here? So um, .NET 8 is all about speed because uh, some of the performance benefits in .NET are enormous. Uh, Steven Tube and some of the other engineers from the .NET team, they take the time to write up the you know, performance benefits of .NET. Uh, you know, take a day off to read that. It's just a lot uh, of optimizations and everything is just so much faster, so much smoother. Uh, so it, it is really nice. Yeah, Sam um, and I deal with a lot of demo apps and I noticed that mine just boot up like instantly now, um, you know, compared to just uh, before .NET 8, uh, you know, things took a you know, couple seconds to boot up. Now it's pretty instantaneous just on some of the things that we work on. It absolutely is. All right, now switching gears to AI because you know everything is AI nowadays, right? So take a look at my extensions here. I do have some Telerik ones here, but I also have GitHub Copilot uh, and other things in here. This is a standard .NET, uh, you know, uh, console app here. But take a look at what we are doing here with a little bit of Copilot. And again, it's an option. It's not something you have to use. It's just an option to show you that these things are there. We are looking into the extension extensibility model of how we can make you more productive with Telerik UI as well. But take a look at this class here. I have a class, and again, how you uh, comment things matters a little bit. So I have an athlete class here, and I am saying this is a class that defines an athlete. Then I have a list of athletes, 
and I'm starting off with, you know, Virat Kohli, Lionel Messi, Tom Brady, some of the you know, greats. But I do have uh, some extra. So this is called the GitHub Copilot. It is a co-pilot. You are still the pilot. You are still the one responsible for running the show, but this is just here as a sidekick, right? So if I do a comma and if I come down, uh, hold on, it's trying to suggest something here. So it says, hey, uh, I'm not offering you C-sharp dev kit because it looks like you have a better uh, you know, uh, assistant next to you. So if I do a tab here, uh, you can see in ghost text, it's starting to recommend what's next, right? It says, hey, Kobe Bryant is next. I will say accept with the tab or I can re reiterate on it. I go down here, now it says Michael Phelps is swimming. That's great. Uh, one more, uh, Usain Bolt's running. Yep, I'll take that as well. So you can see how quickly uh, it can actually look at your code and start you know, iterating over this. Now, let's just say I have these list of athletes and now I am trying to write a function uh, to do something else about it. So it's all about you know, context. So it's, it's starting out listing like, do you want a list of sports? Like, no, that's not really what I want. What I maybe want is a static function of, um, you know, list of athletes by name so you can you can see that it starts guessing a little bit so it's very dependent on um the context that you are and so it start starting to you know give me a list of things as i'm starting to you know type my method so that's nice uh, what if i don't want any of this so let's go back in here what if i just wanted a comment here so i'm gonna say um function to filter athletes by sport. So you see how it's not even letting me finish and it comes up with it. I tab in once and I hit enter and it comes up with a static list of athletes where they're you know filtered by sport and I hit tab and it's there. So again, it's there for you to help. Uh, and if you don't like something, here's uh, where you can actually ask the AI to see what it is. So I can do command I and now I get a inline uh, chat so I can do explain. So why did you give me that piece of code? So if I say explain, up comes the GitHub uh, Copilot, you know, chat, and it's you know trying to explain why it suggested something. Uh, and if you have code that's it, it's just you know hard to uh, you know comment. Uh, you know you don't have to do that anymore. So I can just do it here, and I can say doc. So give me some documentation on this method that I just wrote. And response is being prepared. It's trying to figure it out. And off we go. So I'm going to hit accept. And all of a sudden, my file here has documentation for every method. So again, it's here to help you. It's up to you whether, you know, how much of this you want to use. And that this chat is really nice. It can be in line or you can you know, totally turn it off. You can have a secondary, uh, you can have a primary view where you see your files. And then you can have a secondary, uh, you know, tab where you see all of your chat. So all of this is, you know, it's here to use. So speaking of AI. Let me tap out of here and show you a few real implementations or you know actual use cases of AI if you wanted to use it. Um, so I'm going to go in here uh, to uh, a project. Let's go to GPT because uh, everything is chat GPT these days, right? So this is a .NET MAUI project, by the way. And uh, this is the solution explorer that you get. Notice how nice my files are, because uh, that you know, extension knows what these files are. If you would rather have the Visual Studio Microsoft type lookout, then you can still have a solution explorer. Uh, notice how in this one here, I still have, like if I look at my dependencies in my .NET MAUI app, it knows exactly, like this kind of looks exactly like Visual Studio, because that's the point, it's a solution explorer. So um, I can go into any particular program here, and uh, I can also choose where I'm targeting. This is already noticing my Mac, but I can do Android. I can do, you know, uh, iPhone and other things like that. But Mac is fine for me. Uh, let me go ahead and run this really quick. Uh, so Ed and me are good friends. Uh, we often do vacations just by ourselves. You know, who cares about our families, right? Uh, so this is uh, coming, trying to come up with, you know, just a quick little uh, demo app of using ChatGPT inside of your .NET apps because you absolutely can. Um, so it's coming up here on my desktop, uh, but you can run the same app on, um, you know, uh, mobile or, uh, you know, web as well. So let's go to the most exciting city in the world. That's, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, which is actually really nice. It's my closest, you know, big airport. Um, so uh, it might take a while and it, it's firing off, uh, you know, calls to, you know, chat GPT to get a list of you know, options. But beyond that, you can have all types of customization on, uh, you know, type of calendars. Uh, so now it come, comes back. Here are some attractions in Cleveland, Ohio. This is literally you going to ChatGPT to ask, 
what are some things to see in this city or what are some hotels? And it comes back with your responses exactly as you expect. Like these are text based responses. And then you can use, yes, you know, utilize calendars uh, or other types of UI from us to make it a nice, you know, AI powered, you know, trip assistant And all of this is just a restful call. So all of your AI is at your fingertips if you wanted to use it. Uh, let me take you here to the main pages, uh, you know, uh, code behind. Uh, so I'm, you know, getting a service, I'm initializing it, and I'm just essentially asking, uh, please enter a location, and then uh, what are some, you know, attractions around that city, or what are some hotels around that city? That's all that I'm doing. So AI is here to help. Sprinkle it if you need to, uh, or if you care in your apps. So speaking of that, let's uh, take this a uh, little further because you don't want my, uh, you know, just sample apps that are not very exciting. You want real apps. So let's go over here. Uh, I am going to take you to uh, an app that's a little better written than what I had here, and that is our Telerik.net Maui app. Uh, let's go into examples here. I'm going to pull up the control sample. Uh, that one is fine here. Now, this is a much, much bigger application uh, with all of our UI, you know, baked right in. Uh, so let's go in here. Uh, let's, you know, start uh, on any any page here. Um, AppSample is fine. Uh, Mac is fine. So let's go ahead and run this really quick. And notice how I, I can do all of this from Visual Studio, but I can also do it from VS Code. So it's you know, up to you. So our with .NET 8, you're going to see all of our UI light up with all of the latest bits in .NET. And it's up to you how much of the newest things you want to utilize, but be it mobile, be it desktop, you're gonna have all types of UI light up for you. So speaking of uh, you know, AI, here is our uh, you know, chat AI. Uh, this is for you to have that interactive chat experience. It's actually uh, you know, not dependent on whatever is the backend. This one happens to be in Azure, but it can be chat GPT, it can be any other you know, AI type bot here. Uh, so, you know, time with friends is what I'm looking at. You can, again, start seeing the experience of, you know, having those calendars. When do you want uh, to leave? Ed and me want to leave right away, like tomorrow uh, for, you know, seven days. Why not? And, you know, who wants to go to Cleveland when we can go to more exotic places here? So I'm going to say just the two of us. Uh, we are going to go to Spain, right? And uh, it comes back. Like, you can start seeing the experience here. Now, this is kind of a window where you can scroll. This is like a card. So let's just you know choose something exotic in Spain, and now it says, hey, would you like you know flights? Yes, why not? Uh, this is an app that's written in Sofia, so you know it starts you know listing out flights from Sofia to uh, somewhere in in Spain, and it's going to come back with some you know flight options. I am done, and and so on. So this is you know AI integrated inside of your chat type applications. Maybe you're writing a support application, anything that you need you know, chat for. So what you're seeing here is a sample of all of our .NET MAUI uh, you know, UI inside of desktop. And the same exact app works for mobile as well. And don't take my word for it. The same app is also out there in the app stores. So you can go and you know check it out. So some of the things that we you know spend a lot of time on you know are the data grids because that's what you kind of need for any type of enterprise app. So this is a full blown data grid uh, with all the functionality that you can think of. You know filtering, sorting, grouping, uh, things like you know frozen columns. And we also with .NET 8 and the latest release, we also have keyboard support across Windows and Mac. So again, think about how we're doing this across WinUI on Windows and across Mac Catalyst on Mac to give you that true keyboard and you know, mouse experience. So you have full flexibility to build a really complex uh, desktop application with uh, .NET MAUI. So all of this UI is you know, right here for you to use. You know, take a look at uh, just this you know, plethora of choices that you have, everything from input controls to data visualization, navigation view if you want to have like a, uh, you know, hamburger menu on the top. If you want to have tabs at the bottom, that's all up to you. A uh, mm -hmm. lot of the enterprise workflows need PDF and, you know, word editing and Excel spreadsheets. All of that is also built in there for you. So, you know, take this to town and make, uh, make some amazing desktop applications, right? Uh, so that's, you know, a quick look at uh, .NET and .NET MAUI. So what I'm going to do here is quickly uh, switch uh, context here uh, to uh, my Windows machine. So let's do a remote desktop. Ed, any comments so far? Any any questions? I'm just answer? wondering who, who's paying for that vacation. <laughs> this, uh, uh, it's, it's coming it's from Sam. Trip, you know, Sam it is work trip. The two of us are just you know working <laughs> away. Uh, all right, so I'm going to connect to my Windows machine, which happens to be you know sitting under my uh, desk here. 
Uh, so I'm just going to connect. Uh, yes, that's fine. Uh, so off we go to my remote uh, Windows desktop. It's just running Windows 11, but it actually has the .NET 8, uh, you know, or .NET, you know, 11 and with a .NET 8 bits in it. And why is it blank or why is it black for some reason? Let's see. And let's see. Oh, it's actually uh, signed me out. That's why. Uh, all right. So we can close this once and try to reconnect. Hold on. And uh, reconnect again. Do you want to sign out the other session? Yes, I want to get in. I know I have, you know, probably six or seven more minutes before I have to hand it off to Ed. Uh, but again, keep the questions coming. Um, okay, so I am on my Windows, uh, you know, eight box. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So I want to show you some more desktop apps. You can, with .NET uh, 8, you can bring in everything that you have done on desktop uh, with, you know, older versions of .NET just forward. So take a look at some of the options here. So I'm going to start here with WPF. So our Telerik UI for WPF is a very, very rich uh, and productive uh, application suite. It's you know 15 years in the making, so lots of engineering that's been poured into this. This app that I'm showing you, your desktop apps don't need to look like battleship gray desktop apps from 2005 or 2010, right? They can look like this. Uh, so this is a WPF app, and you can see it's completely fresh and it looks modern, it is fully accessible and it supports all the things, has amazing UI. So 160 plus UI components built right inside of this app and you can pick and choose which ones you, you know, want. The really complex ones are you know, the 3D uh, type you know, rendering of graphs and charts and grids and all types of you know, complex things. So all of this is out there for you to you know, play around. Uh, some of the newer things we did was uh, if I go into uh, Oh, it's trying to come up with teams, which I don't need right now. Data visualization, if I go in there, uh, we did some uh, new things with maps. You know, take a look at the, our map UI, just how many types of maps it supports, you know, be it, you know, air, uh, you know airline seating, stadium seating, hotel floor plans, you can do it all. Uh, but obviously it works with, you know, a whole variety of mapping providers. This is, you know, the Azure map provider. And again, you can, you know, layer any number of things that you want on top of it. Uh, and really, you know, have a rich experience. In terms of interactivity, uh, this is also something new. This is called the highlight text block. So as your users are start, you know, type, starting to type, you can, you know, uh, start highlighting uh, just a couple of characters of what they are typing in. So you can give them a reason why uh, your autocomplete box or your combo box is showing you the suggestions as the people, uh, as the user is, you know, typing in. So uh, some really uh, good stuff here. And SVG images, um, they are everywhere. Uh, let me go in here. Um, so full support for SVGs if you want to bring in. And SVGs are honestly the way to go, uh, even with like .NET MAUI. If you look at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the code sharing or the asset sharing aspect of it, SVGs really are the best because it can res resize things based on what iOS needs, based on what Android needs or Windows or Mac. Um, so right here in WPF, we got full support for all types of you know, SVGs that you want to bring out, uh, you know, custom colors, we can we can do it all. So you know, bring your SVGs and all of your um, you know, WPF apps are ready to be fresh and looking you know, nice. Uh, so that's WPF. And again, just think about this for a second. This is WPF uh, as we had seen or started in 2005. It's running just fine. This is .NET 8 uh, is the runtime for this WPF app. So uh, speaking of things that are even older, WinForms, extremely productive environment, uh, you know, for developers to build amazing apps. And again, they can look fresh. Uh, this is a WinForms application that's running on .NET 8 as of our last release. So we take a lot of, you know, uh, you know, time to make sure everything moves forward, right? And again, there's nothing holding you back. Um, so again, in the new, uh, you know, uh, WinForms story, uh, what we have done are some, you know, really nice, uh, you know, UI, uh, you know, things. So that's, that's a notification icon here. So I, you know, uh, fired off a notification. Uh, that's the notification that I, you know, see at the bottom of my screen. So if you need to keep the user, you know, updated, I know like Blazor and other things do web style notifications. This is for desktop. And we also have a very nice pips pager and slide view for you. So, you know, classic wizard type look or like a carousal look where you want to, you know, have the user 
uh, just you know tap uh, and it goes around and across you bind it to images or some rich cards or some text and it'll do all of that for you so that's winforms and wpf both running on uh, top of dotnet 8 and if you want to you know do the latest in um, uh, on the on the windows stack uh, with the latest ui and ux win ui is uh, is your thing and again take a look at how fresh win ui can look uh, again uh, hundreds of apps that are running or UI controls that are running on top of WinUI 3 and the latest, you know, .NET runtimes, be it for Win32 as well as for, you know, UWP. Um, here's that same chat experience, uh, but apparently no one's paying for it, so I'm not going to go through the experience. But you can start, you know, envisioning uh, the use case where you have that continuity of experience. You have a chat application that's running .NET MAUI on your iOS or Android, same apps running on web, same apps running on desktop. And we can provide the UI for every one of those platforms. And it's up to you how you integrate it with your services or your you know, AI solutions of choice, right? So um, that's a lot uh, in a nutshell. We talked about containers. We talked about uh, AI a little bit. So choose the right tools that are you know, good for your native apps, um, you know, however you're doing it. Uh, and you know, be productive. We are here to provide you all of the UI. Um, so, in terms of where uh, you know we land, uh, we have we had made a blog post about what .NET 8 means. You can see the support all across. You know, reporting, uh, testing, we are right there as well. Fiddler, if you want to have you know network transparency of how your .NET apps uh, are behaving, you can have full accessibility uh, or access into it. Uh, some of the you know desktop support uh, things we I, I didn't get to show you, but things like scheduler, navigation view, these are really you know, key for your desktop apps that are you know uh, smart and they honor the you know mouse and keyboard. Um, so we uh, we talked about the VS Code uh, extensions. We have one for Blazor. We have one for um, play, uh, for uh, Maui as well. And I didn't get to show you that. So um, Ed, I'm going to steal. Uh, I was supposed to end at 45 minutes. So I got three minutes, right? So I can take just a little bit of time to show you, you that. Can take a this few is... more minutes, Sam. All right, because this is so cool. So I have uh, the Telerik UI for .NET MAUI extension installed right in here. And there's, you know, while you're shopping around, might as well get the one for Blazor because Ed is going to talk about it. Uh, so with that, I can start blank. So if I do a Control Shift P, I'm in my command palette. Right in there is our new template wizard. So I start that off. I can say, um, give it a name, test, and um, go ahead and create that on my desktop. Uh, that's fine. Uh, trial is fine, .NET 8, I'm going to go ahead and create a project. So right in here, without even touching anything else, I am uh, you know, firing off a new template. Uh, now, this is going to be a .NET MAUI template, but with a little bit of you know, uh, sugar that we are sprinkling on top to make you a little bit more productive. Because what it's trying to do is bring in Telerik UI. So uh, just a little bit of plumbing that you have to do, you don't have to anymore. It's just ready, uh, ready for you out of the box. Um, so it's still thinking here for a second. Let's see, it's creating a project. It's done actually. So open in VS Code. So here's our new project and it's nice and shiny. It doesn't have much, but here's a standard, you know, .NET MAUI project that you expect. But if I look at the Solution Explorer here, uh, that's fine. Let's go up here to the Solution Explorer. You are gonna see that we brought in a few things. If I look at my dependencies, uh, let's just say for, you know, Mac Catalyst, Right in there, package-wise, there is Telerik UI for MAUI right there, right? And uh, if I look at my MAUI program.cs, I have that compatibility mode. I have the use Telerik extension method. So everything is wired up for me. And here is my main page. And this is, you know, standard, you know, uh, .NET MAUI stuff, but we just replaced the button in here. So we have a namespace. So we are, you know, giving you all the things you need to start coding right away. Um, so you're you're productive. So you can start with the button. Now here's the other thing we are throwing in. Uh, there are some code snippets that are ready for you. So you can start typing in like Telerik and then the whole thing, or you can just say TM. TM is a short form for Telerik Maui. So up comes uh, our code snippets. And essentially this is just there to help you out um, just so you don't have to type up all the XAML. Uh, so calendar is easy, um, but like something like uh, a scheduler might have a little bit more uh, to it. So let's go pick a scheduler uh, like that one. And while I'm here, I'm also going to pick maybe, um, uh, I, I love our rating control. So let's go get our rating control uh, right in there. So like these are simple examples, but if you can think about a grid, which you're trying to data bind, there is some complexity to it. We're just going to get you a nice point to get started and then you can bring it bring it your own. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and run this really quickly. Um, 
and this is running on .NET 8. Um, oh, I have some errors here because um, it, it actually did not restore. Uh, it's it's not finding my um, uh, it's not finding my uh, NuGet uh, config. So uh, again, once you have this set up, it can go find it, and then you can you know run this uh, just as easily. But you can see the code snippets and how easy it is to you know get started, and then off and running you go with the .NET Maui app with uh, Telerik .NET Maui bits, uh, you know lighting up your UI. So I am almost uh, you know I'm already a minute over, so I'm going to stop here and uh, you know, give the stage to uh, Ed here. But hopefully, uh, I, I jumped over a whole bunch of things, but hopefully you see the promise of uh, where .NET, modern .NET is. It is flexible in, in terms of how you build apps. It's flexible in terms of how you deploy your apps uh, in, in you know, containers. It's flexible in what type of AI you want to bring in, both for coding use as well as for API use. So you're, you know, you're make, making your apps more intelligent uh, and, and so on. So, uh, Q and A, uh, Ed, or maybe we want to uh, skip to you directly, and I will keep can, answering we questions. We can do a quick question or two. Um, I yeah, did see ahead. in chat there was a little bit of confusion. I, I guess it was just maybe semantics. Is um, Maui ready for mobile? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So dot in Maui is the evolution of uh, you know what we call. Uh, let's let's take you to dot in Maui here. Um, so this is the landing page, and it is the evolution of .NET's cross-platform strategy. So now this is essentially something that's evolving from Xamarin. Which, so iOS and Android are kind of given. We know how to do that. We know how to build apps smartly. Uh, we know how to manage our dependencies. And iOS or Android, with shared you know, resources, it's done and given. Even the store deployment story is getting so much better. There, there is a new extension for that as well. But what we are adding on is desktop. So we actually have a lot of customers who we're building next generation of complex desktop apps with Maui. But Maui starts out from you know a mobile first mindset. So absolutely. And then uh, this is a good one, might be a slightly off topic, but I think it, it works. Um, you showed like a lot of SDKs on your machine because you're always tinkering mm -hmm. with all the new things. Sam, how do you manage all of the .NET SDKs? What's the best way well, to like prune those okay. out or? Deal yeah, with everything those. is a folder, so you you know it's living under your you know root user and your you know where uh, you have .dot and installed. You can actually choose where it is, but um, you can blow away the SDKs if it's you know causing you a little bit of you know uh, friction. Blow them away, and you can reget them. You can, I mean, as we saw with you know self-contained deployments, you can bundle .NET with your apps. So if you have, because I mean the SDKs will sit there and you know use up a little bit of space. So if you are you know, running up uh, on space shortage, or if you just want to clean up your machine, go ahead and remove that. It's just a very fixed location where .NET installs its bits and where the you know global tools go in terms of you know the command line. And then your NuGet caches, those are all in a very fixed space. So go ahead and clean up a little bit if it you know if it helps. And uh, one, one more good one before we transition over, because we're going to talk a little bit about mobile. Um, Android and iOS, uh, which is better for those platforms, Maui or Uno? Oh, uh, that's a different question. Um, all right. <laughs> so let me uh, take you to uh, a quick little thing while we're talking. Um, um, .NET Maui embedding, maybe? Um, hold on. Uh, this one here. Okay, so what exactly is Uno platform? So uh, the visual markup that we are using uh, to describe the UI of our application, it doesn't need to be one thing. So you can do all up C sharp if that's what you want to do, or you can do XAML, which is extensible application markup language. It is like XML, as much as you know Ed hates uh, XAML, or maybe hates is a strong term, doesn't like XAML. It is like HTML. It is just a markup language. So um, XML, you know XAML as we as it stands, like it has been used for so many different types of applications over the years. So there are a few dialects of XAML. So if you come from a WPF background, then you know you are used to a certain type of XAML. If you come from you know WinUI or UWP background, then you are used to a certain dialect of XAML. And to me, like once you learn one, you can learn everything else as well. Um, but if you are you know keen on maintaining your dialect of XAML, then Uno platform is another open source. Uh, 
know, solution that's going to take that, uh, you know, when you are XAML and run it on iOS, Android, um, you know, Windows and Mac and other things. Uh, so this is not supported by Microsoft. But again, I know the folks, uh, they're doing fine. Um, they, in fact, have opened up a new thing called .NET MAUI embedding. So even though they have their own renderers for iOS, Android, but they're able to render .NET MAUI UI on top of it. Um, so uh, let's see if I can show you uh, another post here. Uh, let's see, Uno platform, uh, maybe this one here. So uh, any of our uh, .NET MAUI UI uh, that you want to render on iOS or Android, it will also work inside of Uno platform apps. But just understand that this is not .NET MAUI. So if you're looking for a Microsoft backed solution, then you may want to go with .NET uh, MAUI. But if you're okay with you know WinUI XAML and that's what you love and that's what you want to do, then go you know go to Uno platform. UI-wise, you're not going to be stuck. You can render all of our Telerik UI everywhere. Awesome. All right. All right. I should probably take over here, Sam, so yeah. we don't have too much time. Let's uh, we can get you the floor here, now. and I will you know, respond to any other um, questions as they come up. All right, folks. So we're going to talk a little bit about Blazor hybrid apps with .NET MAUI. Uh, as we transition into talking about Blazor. So Sam covered MAUI in general and a lot of uh, options that we have with deploying to desktop, mobile, iOS, and Android. Um, I personally like to use web uh, technologies to do my development. I know MAUI is a great option if you're a XAML expert and um, you can write your UI with that. I like HTML and CSS myself. So uh, with MAUI, comes a stack that we like to call Blazor Hybrid, which uses um, an embedded technology inside of a .NET MAUI app so we can deploy to um, multiple uh, cross-platform targets. So it's a blend of native and web tech. Um, I can use CSS, HTML, JavaScript. Um, it's all wrapped up in this nice web view container uh, that's inside of the .NET MAUI app. And this gives me uh, via .NET access to platform features, cameras, sensors, gyros, all of those things, that nice device hardware API through the MAUI APIs. Um, this means I can deploy to desktop and, and mobile and uh, target those specific hardware functionalities. Um, that means I can push my apps into the App Store as well. So, uh, you know, on the web, we have lots of choices to deploy our applications. Uh, there's PWAs, and we can install uh, through a PWA. But with PWAs, we just don't get that same um, native uh, App Store type of deployment. Um, with Blazor Hybrid, we can actually ship our apps into the App Store um, and either sell them or deploy them that way. Uh, so there, there's a couple really good benefits just in that regard uh, in choosing Blazor Hybrid to deploy your application. Uh, so as I mentioned, these applications are a container. Uh, so the Blazor application is actually wrapped inside of the .NET MAUI application inside of a Blazor web view, which is a specialized web view um, that is uh, specific to Blazor. And what that web view does is it not only boots up Blazor, but as we'll see in the demo here, it targets the device, uh, the device's .NET platform. So the runtime that's on that device is the one that we're going to use. So there was a question in chat, does Blazor Hybrid use WebAssembly? Does it use server-side rendering, et cetera? Actually, it uses client-side rendering, but not with, Bla not with WebAssembly but with the .NET runtime that is on the device that you're using. Um, and this lets us go to any platform because we have .NET everywhere these days. Uh, one thing that's uh, nice about all of this as well, um, similar to WebAssembly, we don't have a requirement for internet connection. So we're not relying on the server to render views. Um, the only thing we might uh, require a server for is some data. So uh, in the example that I've got next, you'll see that we, we use some data to get, uh, or use a server to get some data on our uh, application. And there, there's some caveats with it that we'll work through. 
Um, one thing that I really like about this approach is I can bundle all of my application logic, views, components, all of that in a Razor class library in a centralized location. And then I can use different front ends, whether it's web or Blazor hybrid to deploy. So I have one place, one shared uh, project with uh, basically all of my applications, views, and code, and then I have my different front ends that I published in there. They're basically just shells wrapping the application. So let's take a look at what that scenario looks like. And uh, so, Sam, is my guys, screen sharing okay still? Yes, yeah. So while you're getting into it, just to answer a quick thing and just to clarify, folks were asking about um, Blazor Hybrid versus like Electron. So th this desire to have web apps running on mobile or desktop, this is nothing new, right? It's just the mm -hmm. tools and the frameworks have just gotten so much better. Uh, PWAs are a great option if you are okay with the web as a distribution model, you can still go to the stores. Electron is kind of for desktop only because it can be a little heavy handed. So the difference between Electron and Blazor Hybrid here is Electron is a Node.js application and it ships with Chromium as the engine. So you have a browser yeah. that's built in. Uh, so that's the one you have to keep updating while Blazor Hybrid and .NET MAUI takes the approach of everyone has a modern browser. So we're gonna go ask for a browser component from Windows, from Mac, from iOS or Android. So you're not responsible for the browser updates. You just have a modern canvas to layer up your you know, web view and like what Ed said, Blazor is not running on some separate server. It is Blazor and .NET Maui have the exact same runtime. And that's .NET 8 today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if you're you're looking into Electron, make sure you do your homework on uh, how mobile uh, deployment works. It's actually not recommended by most folks. They they say it just eats through battery. So if you like your users or love your users, <laughs> you might not want to take that approach. Uh, everything that I've read about says it, it just eats battery life on mobile devices. Well, so. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, Electron is really not meant for because it, I mean, it's, it mm -hmm. needs a Node.js process running. But on desktop, like your VS Code, your Figma, your Slack, those are still Electron apps. So if you know yep. what you're doing, it, it is fine. And you can render desktop, all of our yes. Blazor UI on desktop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in this application, you'll see that I've got um, what I call the Blazor app. I've got my Maui application. I've got a server app. I even have unit tests in here, which is nice. And I have a web WebAssembly application. Um, now the server is not supplying any of the web views for this app. It is only there for data. So there's some web APIs in there. If we pop this open, um, you'll see that uh, there's just an error page um, and a weather service. Uh, which is uh, providing some generic weather data that's being published out to the different front ends that I have. Uh, so no, no views in there, nothing server-side rendering, none of that inside of the server itself. And then um, I've got a Blazor app uh, up here. And the Blazor app doesn't really have a home. It doesn't live anywhere on the browser or the server. Uh, et cetera, it just has all of the components and features and pages for my application. So this can go anywhere that I publish it. And then I have a Blazor WebAssembly app that you'll notice is missing components and pages. There's no pages, no components in here whatsoever because it gets all of that from this Blazor app up here. So the WebAssembly app is for the browser. And then on Maui, I do the same thing. You're gonna notice there's no pages or components or anything really in this app because it's getting them all from here. So I've got one code base, which is my Blazor app. And then I have my Maui shell and my WebAssembly shell, and I can run this application on web, desktop, mobile, and elsewhere. Um, and then another thing that's really nice about this is I can unit test the Blazor app. Um, and I know all of my components are unit tested. So I have all my tests in one place as well. I don't have to have specific tests for Maui or specific tests for WebAssembly. I'm actually testing this library of UI components here. So if I jump down in the test explorer, you can see if I run this really quick, I can test those out and we'll get results down here. 
And uh, I've got my weather component that I've built uh, getting tested. And if there were any errors, they would show up in our detail summary on the right-hand side. So we go troubleshoot those things. What's really nice about this is I don't have to keep launching a browser or an app and manually going through and checking things to see if there are problems. Now, no, Ed, uh, on this front, before you move on, I wanted to say if you were okay running your browser or maybe even doing it headless, because the, now the moment you bring in Blazor on a desktop or you know other canvases outside of Windows, you can do things like Test Studio where you can do automated testing you know, off your Blazor UI as your app is running on desktop. Yeah, if I was going to do some end-to-end -end testing, I could fire up uh, Teller Test Studio. I could run through my entire application in the browser using Test Studio. Um, this gives me a nice uh, short um, dev cycle, though, uh, where I can go um, at the unit level and unit test out my components as well. So um, a lot of times you're you're going in and you know checking the layout of something or uh, making sure some functionality is working inside of the app itself. Uh, you can do all of that in a quick unit test, and we have tools to help you with that as well. You'll see I'm doing some mocking in here, Sam. And uh, what better way to mock something than to use Teller Just Mock? So we can just call mock.create in there with Teller Just Mock. Um, and then we can uh, use Just Mock to uh, wire up our services and things without having to create a fake implementation of that thing. So just with one quick line of code here, I've got a weather service um, mock of my iWeather service interface, and uh, my component will render um, with that, uh, that weather service. And then when I'm rendering this out, I just call mock.arrange, and I say, you know, what do I want this weather service to actually go ahead and populate as far as data? So I can put some test data in here um, and for this scenario, I'm actually using something called auto data, and it will pull in data uh, or generate data and populate it along with just mock. So there, there's some nice uh, te testing methodologies that we can use there, and we've got some Teller tooling in there to help us as well. All right, so let's go ahead and fire this up. I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, my uh, server, and I'll do start uh, let's do without debugging. It just goes a little bit faster. You can see how instantly on that was thanks to .NET 8. Um, it's now up and running. And this is the obligatory laser example that you always see with the counter and the fetch data component here. Now, uh, this is running in the browser and I did run the server app. What the server app is doing is it's um, it's looking for routes and it is finding this WebAssembly application and hosting this WebAssembly app. So again, the server isn't doing the rendering necessarily here. It's just serving up this WebAssembly app uh, that's running inside the browser. Um, the next thing I wanna do is uh, fire up my MAUI application. So let's go ahead and do that as well. And I've got, you could see up here, uh, my blazer app.maui selected, and I've got a, a pixel emulator here. We'll go ahead and run that without debugging as well, just to make things boot up just a little bit quicker. You're not bringing it and... to iOS? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, the same app will work, yeah, but you can see the flexibility here. And I think while you're mm -hmm. running this, you know, somebody else had a question in the chat room, but it is the same exact UI component that you see but now it knows that it's responsive because it's a smaller you know, surface area, but the same UI component is what Ed is referencing from his web app, which is WebAssembly, and from the MAUI app and, and so on. Yeah, so this is coming from, uh, let's jump back over. Oh, the emulator's picking up some clicking behaviors there, but this is still the same Blazor app here running inside of the shell um, that is wrapped inside of this Maui application. So it's all coming from this Blazor app. It's just a different shell that's wrapped around the outside of the app, making everything work. 
Um, and I can inject different services in there depending on whether I'm on the web or on a, uh, mo a mobile device because I might want to take advantage of some of the features on that device, camera, sensors, et cetera. So I can swap some of those things out through dependency injection, if defs, and there, there's even some ways to target things specifically um, inside the platforms folder here if you want to do something very specific. Uh, so there, there's flexibility across the board in regards to that. But what I want to point out next here, Sam, is when I click on weather, uh, my app's kind of going to crash. And there's an error. Uh, reason for that is uh, my, uh, my application here, my server application, is running on localhost, right? And a Maui application running in an emulator or some connected device somewhere doesn't know what local host is, does it's it? It's a VM, a simulator is a VM. <laughs> yeah, so it's local host, you know, it's it's IP address for local host is not the same as the one running on my dev machine. So that poses a problem. And I need to specify something here, or I need to put in some kind of uh, little shim to work around it. But what Microsoft has done with .NET 8 in the release, the release of Visual Studio is included this nice little utility for me. And I don't know if you've taken a look at this recently, Sam, but if we go up into um, our server app here, I'm gonna pick server again. And under uh, the attached devices here, you'll see dev tunnels. Mm -hmm. um, I can go into dev tunnels here and select one of my dev tunnels. I'll go ahead and run the application again. And you'll notice that localhost is now not part of the URL. Let me close this other tab out so we don't get confused. And you'll see this URL it spit out up here. So this is actually being hosted um, in Azure, not the whole application, but just a like a kind of like a VPN. So we're port forwarding through Azure, and uh, this is made public for my applications to consume. So if I take this URL. I'm going to go back over to my Maui application over in Program CS here, and then I've got this on my clipboard. I didn't want to have to try to memorize that URL, so we'll go ahead and paste that back in. You'll see my my URL getting uh, used over here, and then we'll go ahead and run um, the Maui application again, and that should reboot really quickly. And once it does. I should be able to go over to my weather page and there's my weather. Mm -hmm. How about that? <laughs> so that's that's called Dev Tunnels and that is baked into Visual Studio now. Um, it was in preview for a bit, so you might want to read about that, give that a try. Uh, not exactly part of the .NET 8 runtime or anything like that, but it shipped along with .NET 8. So um, yeah, you can configure that in a ASP.NET application um, underneath of uh, this menu here where you see dev tunnels. You go to create new dev tunnel. There's some wizards that you go through, uh, select security features, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, you get your URL that you can uh, share with your um, application uh, clients. Um, you can share them with, uh, you know, stakeholders in the company that are maybe testing the application, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice utility that they've included. Is dev tunnels on VS Code is a question that just came in. You know what? I'm not sure um, about that myself. I, I haven't checked into whether it's in VS Code or not. Um, so I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but I think they have like a command line thing that you can do. So that gets I, you. you know, yeah, I space. would assume there's a command line for it. Uh, another demo that I wanted to do, but uh, because of the way we stream and all of the cameras that I'm using here uh, and the way that the Android developer tools work, uh, the, I guess there's a collision with my camera being an Android device and my Oculus Quest 3 being a uh, an Android device. But essentially, you plug in your Quest um, and you can deploy to it as well. Oh, look at that. So, uh, it's a little bit hard to stream uh, with this thing on my head, and like I said, I'm, I'm, it's not connecting anyway. But uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the same Maui application running inside of augmented reality, which is 
pretty cool. And uh, there's really actually a nice web uh, developer workflow in this as well. So um, you can connect uh, your desktop device into the application running in the headset. Uh, you basically remote desktop in, you can see your dev environment side by side with the application running in AR, um, and you can continue to debug your application, uh, run it, test it, all of that right inside of the headset. So it's pretty, it's pretty uh, a neat experience to try out. I'm still kind of experimenting with it, looking for practicality, uh, things like that. But essentially it shows up here under your Maui app, and instead of it saying Android right here, it really uh, just says Quest 3 on it. And um, you know, there's very little configuration to make that work. It's just uh, giving dev permissions, basically, and that just uh, is up and running. Uh, so sorry we couldn't demo that live, but it does, yeah, who, does work. You'll have who to needs practicality when you can, you can have cool tech, right? Exactly. It's like Sam said, why would you do this? It's like, wow factor. Why not, Sam? I mean, it's augmented reality. Um, it's it's an interesting new space. So I'm, I'm over there dabbling, checking things out, kicking the tires, see what, uh, what we can do with it. Um, so Blazor Hybrid is, is really amazing. It lets you deploy uh, to web, desktop, mobile, and even... Um, the metaverse. So uh, that that is something that is uh, definitely a modern technology that is future facing. And it's all built with Blazor. And Blazor got a lot of love this uh, time around with .NET 8. So we're going to shift over to just talking primarily about Blazor and ASP.NET Core and what has happened in that space. And we'll probably end up wrapping up there. Uh, so first of all, Blazor got a new unified architecture. And what that means is when you're talking about Blazor in uh, the sense of ASP.NET, uh, again, we're shifting away from Blazor Hybrid here and over to ASP.NET Core. Uh, on, on ASP.NET Core, Blazor uh, used to have this concept of are we going to run this on the server or are we going to run this on WebAssembly? Uh, now we've got a unified architecture that we'll talk about and how that works. A uh, big part of that is the new server static rendering capability that it has. Um, and this lets us uh, write Blazor applications that can uh, render without interactivity. And this is really great for SEO. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the details of that. And then we have the ability to choose our interactivity from there with server side and client side. Um, and then there's a new feature called enhanced navigation that is also very nice. So Blazor lets us build apps faster. And this is not just my opinion, but several um, other industry folks, uh, Dan Roth especially, thinks this is one of the fastest ways to build applications uh, because we don't have to rely on the JavaScript ecosystem. Don't get me wrong, JavaScript's great. It, it does build you know, um, great AAA applications, uh, but if you're a .NET developer like myself, uh, you wanna use one language, you wanna use one framework, and you wanna use one build system. Uh, I'm not a big fan of running a bunch of uh, CLI commands and configuration tools and JavaScript JSON files to get something up and running. I want to just use my .NET skills and build the application. Uh, and that's what Blazor does for us. And with this new unified stack, we can build full stack applications uh, with Blazor. And uh, you know, we've got against server static rendering, enhanced navigation and form handling, streaming rendering, uh, interactivity per component or per page, um, and automatic render mode. So a lot of new things uh, that we'll dig into here. So in uh, .NET 7 and earlier versions of .NET, uh, we had the choice of running Blazor on the server, We'd spin up some web sockets, talk to the application using SignalR, do our updates uh, over that web socket connection. And that was running Blazor completely on the server. Um, we also have the ability to run Blazor in the browser using WebAssembly. And uh, we use the .NET runtime and WebAssembly for that. And uh, all of the processing 
takes place on the client. Well, with .NET 8, uh, we have static server rendering as well. And what that does is lets us just write uh, statically rendered pages out to the browser. And this is nice for SEO, performance, uh, that sort of thing, better user experience. Um, and this is more of the classic way of building web applications as well. So we're just using HTML and form posts to do work. Uh, so this is great for scale, especially if you're doing marketing sites, and you don't have a lot of interactivity on, on many of your pages, presenting information like dashboards, uh, and then basic things like navigation, simple forms that don't require a whole lot of real-time interactivity. Um, if you do have that rich inter interactivity, need event handlers, real-time updates, things like that, uh, some sort of interactive model would be great. But a lot of our pages don't require those type of things. Again, if you've got a lot of marketing stuff on your site, you don't wanna to have to spin up a WebSocket for that page or uh, have WebAssembly, um, the .NET runtime for WebAssembly installed uh, to make that happen. So static server-side rendering is a great way to get SEO and performance out of our applications. So previously, we had to select uh, server or WebAssembly uh, for our entire applications with uh, a Blazor app. And this global interactivity model is still available on .NET 8, um, but it was the only way to do this before .NET 8. So .NET 3 to, uh, to now, uh, we could choose whether we wanted server-side interactivity or WebAssembly. With the new static server rendering in .NET 8, static server rendering is the default. So Blazor will render on the server. Um, Blazor can run completely on WebAssembly if we want to, but most people out there um, are using Blazor along with a .NET server anyway. So the default choice here now is to render everything statically from the server. So we have static server rendering, and then we can choose individual pages or components that we want to run in WebAssembly or even server. So our whole application doesn't need to subscribe to one of these methodologies. We can actually use all of them together. And this page or component interactivity um, is nice, uh, not only for user experience, page load times, and that sort of thing, but we can set up automatic uh, server and WebAssembly um, uh, components as well. So it will choose WebAssembly if it is present, and if it is not, it will choose server and load the WebAssembly uh, files in the background. Uh, with static server rendering, without that interactivity, um, there are some things that we need to take into consideration. For example, if we have a page that has, say, a catalog of products on it, um, it might need to have some long running service to make that page uh, render completely. Uh, what's nice is uh, this new feature called streaming rendering. And what it does is if I'm static rendering a page, um, I can render a loading option like um, a state where the page has pieces with placeholders, uh, loading indicators, things like that. And I can then stream in pieces of the UI as they render on the server. So this gives us a fast UI uh, render where we're getting the UI out there to the user and then displaying things uh, as they begin loading. And uh, the way it does this is it keeps that connection open so there's no signal R, there's no WebSocket. It's just the, uh, the, the web request um, that's being delayed and uh, letting these pieces get loaded in. Um, it just takes a little bit of UI finesse, which is something that we may be able to help with, like the skeleton components, loaders, and things like that. That might take some time. Um, another feature that we get with .NET 8 is enhanced navigation. Uh, so without uh, using uh, client-side rendering and uh, writing the application you know, with that SPA type technology, what enhanced navigation does is the server is looking at the pages it's rendering 
and looking for changes. So Blazor has an amazing diffing algorithm in it that looks for updates in uh, each of its renders and um, knows which pieces of the web application are changing. And what it can do is say you have uh, you know, a navigation column, something like that. We need to uh, re-render some main content on the page, but we don't have to re-render everything. The header, the footer, the navigation all stays the same. Um, enhanced navigation will actually do that server side for us. So uh, again, this is it, uh, helping with page load times, using fewer requests. Um, it's retaining most of the DOM structure. Uh, so this is all about speed and functionality. You know, getting Blazor faster, uh, getting the users on our site very quickly. Um, the only caveat here might be if you're using a lot of JavaScript. Uh, type of stuff on your uh, application that Blazor is unaware of, um, you need to disable uh, the um, enhanced navigation for pages that make use of a lot of JavaScript rendering technologies. And then with uh, static server-side rendering, we can still do forms. We don't need WebAssembly, or we don't need SignalR to do form interactions. This is something that we've done on the web uh, for quite some time, and it works the same way it always has. Uh, so Blazor will help us a little bit with this. Uh, we can still use our on-submit event handlers, uh, uh, anti-forgery protection, server-side validation, all of this still works. And uh, we still have the same APIs to do the functionality that an interactive component would have. But since it's being rendered on the server with Blazor, Blazor is smart enough to know how to render this on the client and just use uh, web standard uh, form posts to do the work. And then we get into choosing interactivity. And we can choose to have Blazor um, handle everything. Uh, we can mark any page or component as a server or WebAssembly uh, component. Uh, what's nice about Blazor is no matter how we write our components, uh, they can run anywhere. As you saw with my, my application earlier, um, there was nothing in my components that said they were specifically WebAssembly server or even Blazor hybrid um they were just components and uh with blazor and dotnet 8 uh we write those components the same way now they can be server WebAssembly, or even both because we can automatically change the render mode on on those components and they work with these new forms of server side and static rendering as well Uh, the auto render mode, I keep saying we can use these things interchangeably or, or let the server decide. Uh, what this will do is if something is marked automatic, it will choose Blazor server for that component um, if the WebAssembly runtime isn't present. And then it will load the WebAssembly runtime in the background. So the next time the user visits that page or the application, um, then it will use WebAssembly instead. Uh, so this is a nice compromise between running everything on the server where you're paying for that all out of pocket um, on your server infrastructure. It's probably, you know, coming out of your Azure bill. You could turn on automatic mode um, and support the components being run in WebAssembly. So you get that, that instant on capability of rendering things on the server um, and let the resources load in the background. And the next time that that user visits your site or changes uh, between pages, they will start using WebAssembly and that will greatly cut down on the amount of infrastructure you need to provide for that application. Uh, for this to work, you do have to make sure your component um, is in a WebAssembly project. Uh, so uh, for Blazor to be able to uh, do tree shaking and things like that, um, you need to specify uh, a separate WebAssembly project and any page or component that does get rendered through WebAssembly needs to be in that specific project. So it's a little bit of a, a compiler um, thing that we, we need to set up for. So that's Blazor in .NET 8. A lot of new capabilities. 
uh, lets us do a whole lot more faster. Uh, the, the startup times of these applications are just so much better. And uh, getting started with all of this is, again, really easy because we have new uh, app templates to help us select these various render modes and uh, get started with these different concepts. Um, and these are just the tip of the iceberg. There's still more um, uh, performance improvements along with just rendering faster and JSON deserialization through a new JIT interpreter, a just-in-time interpreter that shipped with Blazor and .NET 8. Um, and this, you know, this also complements you know, hot reloading, uh, web packaging, uh, and uh, the CSP compliance or um, security compliance. And then, of course, Telerik uh, here at Progress, the Telerik UI for Blazor was supported on day zero of shipping .NET 8. That means you got 100 plus UI components that are natively written for Blazor uh, that are all shipping uh, now with .NET 8 capability. Uh, you can theme them. I say infinite themes here. We have a bunch of base themes. There's four really solid base themes, and then there are different swatches that we provide. Uh, so there's you know dozens of uh, themes out of the box, but really with Theme Builder, this is an infinite choice. You can go into Theme Builder, customize all of our themes uh, at a granular level, change colors, borders, all of that stuff. Um, theme Builder's uh, a great extension to uh, the platform here. And you get uh, accessibility with our components, globalization, localization. Uh, we have an excellent uh, tool online called the Blazor REPL, which, let, which lets you try out Blazor in the browser without installing any IDEs or utilities on your own machine. You just jump on the web, open up a browser, and you can start hacking away on Blazor samples right there. It's at blazorrepl.telerik.com. So Ed, if I can jump in just for a second uh, on, on a couple of things you mentioned. Uh, first is folks had questions about accessibility, folks had questions mm -hmm. about globalization, localization. This is what we bring to the table. These are things that you're gonna spend a lot of engineering efforts trying to get it right, or you can just you know have it ready uh, out of the box. And you know it's December, so it's the time for a lot of like code advent type you know calendars and, and the REPL folks, uh, you know, Ed included. There's a whole month long series of you know uh, very interesting uh, blazer bits uh, showing off all the capabilities and then um, Ed we may want to keep like two minutes towards the end for some Q&A and I may want to just you know show a couple more things that were asked okay um, so real quick I just want to show like we have um, our file new project templates you showed some of these for uh, the Visual Studio Code and uh, MAUI applications. We have these for Blazor as well, and we have Blazor Server, Client, Hybrid, the new um, Blazor web app that has the automatic. Um, and then here's all of those swatches I was talking about that we have. And again, you can customize those uh, with uh, Theme Builder as well. And uh, we can fire up a brand new application really easy, use all the new concepts that I talked about, and the Teller components are all uh, part of the project as well. I'll give this a quick run, Sam. Um, and you know, it's the the usual Hello World application, but this one has those Blazor or the uh, Teller UI for Blazor uh, bits as part of it. And before we go, I just want to show that um, we not only have the fact that there's uh, UI components here, and this may not run because it's looking for, I think it's looking for a dev tunnel. Is it still set up for dev tunnels? Yeah, you changed your settings in the last project. Yeah, I need to change that to none. So this one wasn't configured for dev tunnels, so it was, it was trying to load the dev tunnel. But I've got a Telerik button here. Uh, I still have the uh, classic, uh, uh, HTML rendered table here. So let's go real quick, Sam, and fix that. I'm gonna jump over to the weather component. You'll see in here, we're just explicitly writing out like the data to a table here. I'm gonna copy and paste a short snippet of code in here. I'm gonna delete oh, code, this. Code snippets. And um, I'm gonna put a Teller grid in there 
And I'm just going to data bind that to forecasts and set auto generate columns to true. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go ahead and run the app again. And we'll have a Teller data grid in there, which has a lot more features than rendering that to a table. Plus, you don't want tables. HTML tables are yeah. not the best. So we could add sorting, filtering, custom paging, templates, uh, CRUD operations, all of that right to this Teller UI for Blazor data grid that I just created with uh, one, two, three lines of code here. And if we wanted to go even further, and uh, we could scaffold this out. So if I go to my client application here and select, uh, there's a lot of items in here. There should be a Telerik menu in here. There it is, Telerik UI for Blazor, scaffold new item. I could even come in here and scaffold out any of our really rich UI components using mm -hmm. scaffolding tools here. Uh, so I could come in, create a grid, give it a page name, uh, connect it to a, a model and a data service, um, select columns if I'd like, uh, create CRUD operations, all of that, hit finish, it's gonna scaffold out that view for me and save me a whole lot of typing. So we've got a Indeed. lot of capabilities there. Um, of course, Blazor Hybrid's uh, officially supported by Telerik UI for Blazor. .NET Aspire is actually something that folks were asking me quite a bit about. Uh, so I'll make it the uh, quickest .NET Aspire recap possible here. Uh, first of all, you need to be on Visual Studio Preview to take a look at .NET Aspire because it is a preview item. It is not uh, shipping the um, uh, globally available bits yet. Uh, so you want to be in Visual Studio Preview, and then you need to have the workload installed. So on your Visual Studio installer, you have to have the .NET Aspire workload. Uh, I have that, so I'm going to pick the .NET Aspire uh, starter application, and we'll go ahead and fire up one of these. What .NET Aspire is, um, it's a orchestrator pattern that the folks at Microsoft are working on to allow you to build microservices and uh, micro front ends um, and cloud-based uh, infrastructure really easily using uh, this orchestrator pattern, some Visual Studio wizards and tooling. And uh, this is what we've got so far. And you will see a lot more options, I believe, showing up uh, beneath this, uh, whether they change the UI for it or create more checkboxes, what have you. Uh, right now, we can select whether we want Redis caching or not, um, and whether we want a, a starter Blazor application or not. So I've got all of those items selected. So we'll go ahead and add everything here. Um, and you can also select these things through uh, some nice, um, all right, what do you call it? Uh, build pattern type of code here as well. We can look at that in the app host. And this is that orchestrator pattern I was talking about. And the items that I selected here, you, uh, you see with reference to caching, that's my Redis cache. And with reference to API service, that is my uh, Blazor, or sorry, my ASP.NET Core um, web API service that was added to this. Um, and then there's also a front end web project as well. So you get this builder pattern. I could add um, all sorts of microservice infrastructure here, and then it's going to build and run the As Aspire um, application. So I'm gonna hit run here, and it's gonna even ask me if I wanna start Docker because uh, Docker is required for Redis. So it's gonna go ahead and start up my, my Docker instance here. And then uh, what's really neat about all of this is you get a dashboard that is smart um, and uh, connected to all of your web services, your, um, your microservices, et cetera, that could come in and say, I wanna take a look at my front end. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on that. There's my Blazor front end. It's connected to my web API back end which is my API service here. I could click on that. You could see there's my data from my backend. And then we've got logging, uh, container information, uh, tracing metrics, the whole nine yards inside of this nice dashboard uh, that is all provided by that host. And the host keeps everything interconnected as well. You'll see I have all of these endpoints up here uh, and they're all named endpoints. And one of the really 
uh, cool things about this is uh, we saw this earlier in my Blazor Hybrid demo. I'd love to attach a Blazor Hybrid uh, instance to this as well and see how it runs. But uh, you saw me go in and paste this awfully long URL that was running through a dev tunnel inside of this client base address here. Notice this one says API service. So that, that doesn't look like a familiar URL to any of us probably. What, what this is doing is that orchestrator pattern is subbing in the actual um, HTTP address uh, in place of that API service for us. So that, that orchestrator really uh, makes things a lot easier, uh, not only in the host app, but in the various um, uh, microservices that are running in it as well, because it, it keeps track of these things. So we don't have to, we just reference it by the name of that, um, that microservice that we want to attach to. So there, there's a lot of interesting things happening over in this .NET, expire, uh, .NET Aspire um, area. So make sure you check it out uh, and see what type of components are being added in there. Um, they're going to be coming in the form of NuGet packages. Uh, I think you'll see them appear in the wizard uh, that I showed you on the main screen. And um, I think it's just this plug and play infrastructure for microservices that's really cool and built with .NET. Okay, so this was where we kind of left off. This was the VS Code thing um, with the new extension. So we spun up a .NET Maui project. It already has .NET 8 things wired up. And uh, in my Solution Explorer, you can see I'm already bringing in our generic Maui bit. So my NuGet wasn't, you know, resolving the source. Um, so with that, I can, you know, go back into XAML. We were uh, typing in some code snippets here with the calendar, the rate rating, and the, you know, scheduler. Uh, so that's just how easy it is to, you know, start bringing in things here. I'm going to run it uh, really quick on my Mac desktop. So again, these are desktop apps that you're writing for Windows, for Mac, uh, with all types of, you know, fancy UI. Uh, so you get the default dot and everything, but you now have some Telerik UI added to it. There's the calendar, uh, there's the rating UI, and there's the scheduler. The scheduler took us a long time to do it right uh, because it's a very involved, very complex uh, control uh, for all of your desktop needs. So that that's all there. Now, Ed kind of uh, alluded to this. Let me show you that running really quickly. Everything has to be live, right? Otherwise, you won't uh, believe that it is true. So here is a .NET Maui app with the Blazor template. And I think when Blazor is running on, uh, you know, desktop or mobile, some of those, you know, rendering modes, they don't really matter because like everything is on the client already. Um, so what you'll notice here is this is a .NET Maui app, but I'm bringing in Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, it doesn't care because in the CS proj, the project type is already SDK style Razor. And with that, like I can bring in Maui program.cs, one line of code here to add Telerik Blazor, which is exactly what you will do for your web apps anyways. Uh, and then index HTML has a couple of, you know, uh, CSS references. Uh, but off and running we go. Here's my index.razor with the Blazor UI component. I can go ahead and run this really quick. So this is the whole Blazor hybrid story, and it is officially supported. So for folks who were asking, uh, this is all Telerik Blazor UI, right? This is all meant for web apps, but it's working just fine on desktop and mobile. And unlike Electron, we are doing things much more, you know, lightweight. So this is uh, absolutely fine. Uh, folks who are asking, this has got, yes, nothing to do with Maui. But, uh, you know, once you start being in the native space, you might, you know, want to utilize some of the Maui bits. But if you just have Telerik UI for Blazor, by all means, go go for it. Uh, you know, render it on mobile and desktop. We are going to stand by it uh, with official support. What happens is, like, if I, you know, shrink this, uh, this is a date picker. Uh, you see how this is keyboard and mouse, you know, centric. But if I, you know, really shrink this down uh, to a mobile form factor. So Blazor goes into you know, the, the hamburger menu. Now, if I do that date, the same thing is much more touch friendly. So you know, we'll try to help you out. That's the generic date picker, the Blazor date picker with, with an adaptive mode of auto. So it tries to recognize. So we'll help you out with some responsiveness. But uh, what you see here is all of Blazor UI in a mobile or a desktop form factor. You can also bring in our Angular UI or our React UI and you know, light up your .NET MAUI apps as well. 
well. So that's kind of coming up next, not not at nine. You can still do it right now uh, if you know the plumbing, but uh, it's something uh, Microsoft and us, uh, we can enable you to do with .NET 9. And also, uh, you know, going back to uh, some of the Q&A, if I can, you know, start wrapping things up here. Um, there were some comments about, you know, just how many choices, you know, we have. And, and I hear you completely. Uh, if it's getting confusing, like which one do I choose for my desktop stack, uh, you know, take a deep breath and try to figure out what do you have investments in. If you are running WPF, you know, WinForms or WinUI, you are absolutely fine. Keep running, uh, you know, and having complex desktop apps. But if you are starting up something greenfield new, then look at .NET MAUI, uh, look at Blazor Hybrid if you are already doing, you know, uh, web stuff. So. A uh, lot of things going on, a lot of moving pieces, but I think uh, modern .NET is just enabling us to just to do a lot more code sharing across the across the board. Um, and uh, we will keep, you know, uh, answering some of your questions, uh, especially if you are asking us on the social media. We'll get back to you. Uh, tune in live to Code It Live. That's our Twitch channel where you can see Ed and me and other folks, you know, coding and and doing other things uh, with our UI and just you know randomly playing around with modern tech. Uh, so. You know, as .NET evolves, I hope you can see that we have a lot of ammunition uh, on our hands to go build amazing apps. So, you know, let's go change the world. And, you know, we thank you uh, for, you know, hanging out uh, with us, uh, with Ed and me, and also our support crew behind the scenes. Thank you for your time. Hopefully you see that .NET 8 is here. Uh, with long-term support to enable you uh, to do all the amazing things. And we are here uh, to support your journey, trying to make you a little bit more productive with all of our UI, all of our frameworks and tooling and theming and accessibility so that you have a better time so you can go ship your apps faster and you know go enjoy the holidays. So I think uh, we are already way over time, uh, but you know feel free to reach out to uh, you know Ed and me uh, after the webinar here, uh, so we can you know answer any questions that you might have. And if you have asked things in the Q and A panel, we would love to get back to you. But you know a big thank you from Ed and me and from all of us here uh, for hanging out with us on this webinar. Hope you have a wonderful you know holiday season, and then we'll come back and bring things up in the next year. Uh, but hopefully Morton.net and Telerik uh, enables you to do amazing things in the you know year that's coming up. Well, right, folks. Sam. Yeah. With that, uh, we're going to you know bid you adieu uh, for this year and uh, stay well, stay productive. We'll see you on the next webinar. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.